So today we're talking about another organic macromolecule. This time we're focusing in on proteins. So always talking about how are they built, what are the examples, and what are some functions. These are six protein renderings. So uh, we know enough about organic chemistry to design computer models that can actually look at the sequence of amino acids, which we'll talk about in a second, and predict how those amino acids will interact to form a three-dimensional shape known as a protein. So um, these are six really important examples that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, first, we want to just focus in on what is a protein made of. Well, when we talk about the possible elements, the possible elements are chinox. And these elements are arranged into a monomer. Remember, monomer is the smallest subunit called an amino acid. And if we look at the amino acid, there's lots of things that we'll notice. We'll notice this amine group. So we have this N bonded to two H's, which is bonded to this carbon. This is an amine functional group. Makes it slightly polar. But then on this other side, we have a carboxyl group. And if you remember, sometimes they are called carboxylic acid. So carboxyl or carboxylic acid. And so that's where the name amino acid comes from. What we really want to pay attention to is this thing called the central carbon. So in the middle of the molecule is a central carbon. Here it's bonded to CO, double bonded, and then OH over here, the amine group. And then we really want to focus in on this R. And I've covered it up here, but you can see this R. The R is actually just represents a variable side chain, meaning anything could actually go here. And when we do dehydration synthesis, see the removing of water, when we join these two amino acids, we remove water, and now we actually have what's called a polypeptide. To be accurate, this would be a dipeptide. But a polypeptide chain is multiple amino acids. And so, kind of down here, we talked about what it's named, a polypeptide chain is actually just a chain of amino acids. It's not a protein yet. It's just a chain of amino acids. What makes it a protein is when it folds into a 3D shape. Then we can call it the protein. And we're going to talk about those levels of folding in just a second. But the reason that it folds is because of these side chains, these variable side chains. You've got your basic backbone. You see the N terminus and the C terminus. So it's very likely that you could be given this type of structure and asked to be identify it as a polypeptide chain. Noticing that these side chains that are hanging off are probably going to interact with each other. So it's the interaction, side chains interact, and then they fold. If I have two hydrophilic next to each other, to a hydrophobic, the two hydrophilic will get closer, fold, and the hydrophobic will actually move itself away. So thankfully, you do not have to memorize any of these drawings as much as recognize them. But these are the 20 amino acids that are most common. There are actually some different ones. But these are the basic 20 amino acids. And what we want to recognize is the same
same basic structure on all of them. You can see that these are actually written with the carboxyl group actually as an acid, having donated a hydrogen bond. So that's why these are um, pictured with the O minus on there. But we want to notice that some, all that we need to know is that some are going to be nonpolar. Some will be polar and some will be charged. You don't have to memorize which ones are which. You just have to know that these amino acids have different properties. And the properties depend on the electronegativity and the bonding. So ones with lots of carbon and hydrogen, those are going to be nonpolar. Ones with lots of oxygen and sulfur and um, amine, those are going to be polar. And then any that have actually donated or accepted, those will be charged. So because of these properties, we're going to see that nonpolar will be hydrophobic. And polar and electrically charged will both be hydrophilic. And this is going to become important because as we put these amino acids in order, they're going to fold. And they're going to take on shapes within that folding. And that is what gives us this three-dimensional structure. This three-dimensional structure is very important to the function. We'll talk more a little bit later about specific examples and their functions, especially throughout the year. But for now, we just want to know that the shape that it creates will allow it to do certain jobs. Maybe it can carry oxygen. Maybe it can carry carbon dioxide. Maybe it's a transport protein across the cell membrane. So the shape is going to really determine the function. So what we want to look at now are what are these different, how do we get these different levels? And this is somewhere where you just want to spend some time practicing. We have what's called the primary structure. And that is literally just the amino acid sequence. Now we want to know that the amino acid sequence is actually determined by the DNA sequence. Or more specifically, the DNA determines the RNA, which determines the amino acid sequence. But these amino acids go in a specific order according to that organism's DNA. And so they have to be in that particular order. It's not random. Our secondary structure, we write as the two with the little zero, secondary. These are going to be regular substructures. What well, these are are alpha helixes and beta sheets. And so this spiral here is the alpha helix. These folds back and forth like this would be a beta sheet. And these are caused by hydrogen bonds. And so these are regular repeating shapes that happen mainly just because we have amino acids in a row. And so what we want to know about secondary structure is really that it's caused by these hydrogen bonds that regardless of which amino acids we have, we're usually going to see either beta sheets or alpha helixes or a mix of the two. Our tertiary sequence, our third level of folding, is where we get our true three-dimensional structure. And we call this whole molecule folding. And this is where we see the hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. This is mainly between those R chains. So 
The alpha helix in the beta sheet is usually happening between the other parts of the amino acid that every single amino acid has in common. This tertiary structure is happening more between the R chains. This is also where we're going to see some stabilization by sulfide groups. So any amino acid that has a sulfide, sulfide amino acids, they're going to help really kind of stabilize that molecule. Sometimes this folding actually needs some help, and we have what are called chaperone proteins. And we'll talk more about those later, especially when we talk about enzymes. But for now, we're really kind of focusing on that sometimes they do need some help to fold. The last, the quaternary structure, this is where we have subunits. And so the main thing that we want to know about a quaternary is that sometimes we actually have multiple proteins interacting to become a larger molecule. A primary example is hemoglobin that carries oxygen. It actually has four subunits, two of the A form, two of the B form, and they all interact to form hemoglobin. And that's the picture that we have here. So seeing, okay, first I put my amino acids in order. And these bonds are actually called peptide bonds. That's why it's called a polypeptide chain. These are called bonds. And so once we connect them through peptide bonds, now these are going to be covalent. This is dehydration synthesis. These are pretty strong bonds. Once they're in order, they start to interact, forming hydrogen bonds. That leads to alpha helixes and beta sheets. The alpha helixes and beta sheets interact, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, moving away or towards water to form a three-dimensional shape. And then different subunits. Not every protein has quaternary structure. Last thing that we want to talk about is that proteins can actually lose their three-dimensional structure. So let me fix this error. Keeping in mind that the three-dimensional structure gives it its function, so it's kind of like if I'm trying to put a nail in the wall, I need a hammer, not a saw. And if it loses its shape, it can't do its job. So if we lose the shape of a protein, it is basically non-functional. And so we want to think, well, what gives it the shape? The shape is really determined by the bonds, the hydrogen bonds, and the phyllic and phobic reaction. So if there's anything that disrupts these bonds, then I lose the shape. We call losing the shape denaturing. And this can happen by a change, we write that delta, the triangle, change in, in the environment. This can be a change in the pH, temperature, or the salinity. Keeping in mind, pH is just a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. If I have more hydrogen ions, then I'm going to change how these bonds interact. And I might break some of these bonds. If I change the temperature, mainly adding I'm going to break some bonds. We'll talk about what cooling is a little later. If I add salinity, I'm adding ions, Na+, Cl-, I'm going to interrupt those bonds. So these changes are going to interrupt the bonds, and I'm going to go all the way down to the primary sequence. So I have not 
change the peptide bond. So I still 